Good evening. Let's sing to Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more and oh for grace to trust him more Lord Jesus I pray that you would teach us tonight I pray Father um, that you would just soften our hearts Lord that we could connect with you in a real way Lord I pray that you would just give us just those spiritual ears to hear what you're speaking to to us this this evening. Lord, I pray that as we are singing these songs that we would have just those intimate moments with you. Although we're in a group of people right now, um, let it just be, it just seem like you and I are, are just talking and just having that one-on-one fellowship, Lord. Lord, you say uh, in your word that as we draw near to you, you're, you're drawing near to us. And so we, we thank you for that. And I thank you that where two or more are gathered, you are also right there. We thank you for those promises, knowing that you are right here. held the oceans in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation arises to rejoice behold our God seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him who 
you're to know the power of your risen life and to know you in your sufferings to become like you in your death my lord so Jesus, we love you. Pray that as, as we are crying out to you, pray requests, Lord, that you would answer us in a way we can understand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's spend some moments in prayer. You're welcome to uh, get into some groups or pray by yourself. Uh, your, your choice.
we have any prayer requests we want to share with the group before we start our teaching tonight? Or praise reports? Granddaughter turning 20. <clears throat> our sound booth is being operated by a brand new 21-year-old. Amanda Gardner's birthday is today. You might wish she's hiding, but you, <laughs> she's back there. 21. What's that? Yeah, the last time she'll divulge her age. Um, I do want to ask for asking for prayer for whoever it was that decided they needed the catalytic converters from the church vans more than we did. Yeah, we discovered, or Corey discovered when he went to get the van to go pick up youth this evening, that both vans have been uh, stolen from. So that, that loud vehicle in the parking lot, that was a church van. Uh, they're really throaty without a catal catalytic converter. So, uh, yeah, pray for that and say, pray we can afford the repairs tomorrow. And yeah, I mean, they get, they get used all week. What's that? No, they're not cheap. <laughs> That's it. When I called the Seabrook um, Police Department on the way to make a report, and, and they'll come and do a report in the morning, first thing the officer on the line says, oh, that's happening all over. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Great. So protect your, your gas tanks and your catalytic converters right now. <laughs> I'm pretty excited. Chili cook-off is on Monday. T minus is five. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're almost there. Um, rumor has it that there will be a $100 gift certificate for the winner and a $50 gift certificate for both second and third place and pretty much nothing for the People's Choice Award. But well, well, 200 bucks, yeah. yeah we, we shall see. Once I get my armadillo thought out, I get my armadillo thought out and get my chili going. My Texas road rash chili is the, I'm scraping them up for a week. <laughs> What's that? I found enough. I found enough. Out at night in Bay Cliff, there's a lot by the ditch. <laughs> uh, all right, well, let's, let's pray then. Father, we uh, well, thank you that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the, in the heavenly places and evidence of all your blessings here. And Father, instead of complaining about the catalytic converters, we're going to praise you that we have two vans and that they're used to bring uh, youth and children to, uh, to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. And uh, we're just used to take the youth to the alligator rescue. And um, we thank you for that blessing. And Lord, we do pray for whoever it was that um, stole them. Father, we pray that uh, you would lead them to higher ground in their life and they would come to a point of repentance and perhaps even one day bless a church because of the guilt of what they did la last night. Uh, Father, we also, uh, as we pray, I want to thank you for birthdays, 20-year-olds and 21-year-olds, and um, it's hallelujah for, uh, for that. Father, we uh, continue to pray for the Ukraine and for our government and the other governments of the world. As it seems none of them have a plan, but we know that you do, and we trust in your plan, Father. We continue to pray for revival in our nation, particularly among our, our government. We ask, Lord, that you be with us as we spend time studying your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Also pretty excited that we're coming up on the Sunday night Blast and Cast Men's Ministry slash First Baptist Church of Seabrook Family Worship on the 27th of March. Um, we'll be, uh, we will be baptizing that night, so hallelujah, it's going to be just awesome celebration. So all of you come, no matter what church you belong to, or if you don't belong to a church at all, or uh, this would be a great time to just come and, and spend time with the, with the people of God and, and just pray and give thanks and worship, and I'm excited about it. All right, so we're moving on in the book of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, calls himself the preacher. I'm going to refer to him quite often tonight as the preacher. Um, tonight we're going to be from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 16, 
and we're going to go all the way through 416. But I'm going to do it in, in, in chunks because it's all kind of, <coughs> excuse me, ties together. So Solomon's continuing his uh, exploration of his will. Remember he said that he's going to set out and check, check out all this stuff. So he's exploring life under the sun, everything under the sun. And now he's going to look at the, uh, the core aspects of the original goodness of God's creation. God is a just and righteous God. So Solomon wants to see the extent of justice under the sun. And God created work as a good activity for Adam to do. So the preacher here, he wants to evaluate the goodness of the work under the sun. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, God declared that it was not good for man to be alone. Uh, so he created uh, for Adam a woman. Her name was, I'm just trying to keep you with me here, uh, to be his companion. So the preacher explores the value of companionship under the sun. So this is kind of already giving you the outline of what we're going through there tonight. And he does this, as he does this, his goal seems to be to give us, as it's been through the first three chapters here, proper perspective. Remember I've told you he's not trying to solve all the problems. He wants to kind of push them out of the way so we can see the truth. So on the one hand, uh, all those things are truly good gifts from God under creation, and we should value all of them as such. But on the other we have to know that sin corrupts all of God's good gifts. Good gifts. So, uh, starting in the looking at justice here, the perspective of justice, if you in the last week's teaching, the Solomon set our hope on an important fact that while we were all prisoner of time, remember that there was a time for everything we talked. Well, we're all prisoner of the, of time. Everything we experience comes as a part of the plan of our eternal God. So we're stuck in time. He's got a plan that was written before the foundation of the world that's not stuck in time. So God is the one who establishes time. God is the one who establishes seasons. And when he ordains whatsoever, whatever he ordains whatsoever comes to pass. Nothing can be added to God's plan. And nothing can be taken away from God's plan. You are not affecting God's plan. All right, so here is verse 16, chapter 3, through uh, verse 4, chapter 3, ESV version of the Bible tonight. Except I think I go to the King James once. Well, maybe that's in Colossians. So uh, I'm doing like three different studies at the same time. They're all jumbling together. Verse 16, moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart, he likes to talk to himself. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them to see that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. Um, before I read through this next section, let me preface this, that this is not meant to be the beginning and the end of all teachings in the Bible. So you're going to hear some verbiage here that I'm going to explain when we get to it. That sounds kind of odd, but I'll, 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 I'll help your understanding when we get there. So don't hitch when you, when you hear this, that we're the same as animals. Because I don't want you to miss what's coming after that. So, for what happens to the children of man, what happens to the beast, is the same. So, as one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. A man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for this is his lot. Who can bring, who can bring him to see what will be after him? Again, chapter 4, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had <clears throat> no one to comfort them. On the other side of the oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead who are already dead, more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who's not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Hmm. So I'm going to stop there. We'll finish the rest of it. So... 
in light of the fixed reality, Solomon's making this observation about first justice. And the first four observations he, he makes, he uses the word, I saw, four times, so that's kind of a little outline here. We're going to go with the four things that he saw. He said, I saw, that's in verse 16, verse 22, uh, verse 4 of chapter 4, and verse 15 of chapter 4 are his I saw words. So under the sun, and that, that term means under the outworking of all God's plan, wickedness displaces justice and righteousness in the world. Specifically, the, the, the language of the place of justice and the place of righteousness, it has to do with the place of public justice. Courts, where, where justice and righteousness are, are, are judged and considered. So in this general observation, this is true in all times, in every form of government, and under all leadership. Now when you think about that, it becomes a little striking when you remember who it is that's writing this. Because he's the king. Solomon's not just the preacher. This is King Solomon. So he's acknowledging that wickedness displaces justice and righteousness in his public court. So as he evaluates this, he reminds himself, quote unquote, I said in my heart, so we run into that, uh, of two important considerations. First, he reminds himself that God will ultimately judge the righteous and the wicked. Verse 17, he said it this way, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. So just as there's a time appointed where wickedness is permitted to flourish, there's also a time appointed for a final judgment. So the consideration raises a significant objection. In God's plan, why does he not see fit to administer justice now? That's kind of what the president of the Ukraine was saying to our Congress today. Why not give us the help we need now instead of allowing all this to happen? And it's a good question. Here's what he said. This is how he answers it. With regards to the children of man, God's testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. That's a pretty humbling statement. We're being tested. And what does he mean by we're the, we are beasts? I mean, that, that's like, so the, yes. Mm -hmm. Like beasts. Yeah, well, the ESV and the, the, the Hebrew actually says are beasts. But that's translated in the New King James and the King James that way to try to get to the explanation of, of, of the text without having to explain it. And we're, we're actually going to run into something else here in just a few minutes, too, that uh, is translated interestingly. Uh, so what the clarification here is in the next verse. This is where he draws a comparison between the similarity of death between humans and beasts, where we are the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. So there are a bunch of other portions in Scripture, especially in the creation counts in Genesis, chapter 1, chapter 2, and, and Solomon's always thinking about them. You can be sure that he was well familiar with Genesis 1 and 2, uh, that, that he's constantly reflecting on that, and he emphasizes the unique human role of dominion over the animals. So he's reminding us that the, of the unique status of human beings does not exempt us from dying. Just because we have this unique status, we still die. Anybody have a problem with that? Do you know anybody who hasn't? Okay. So we're in the right room here. And then the consideration regarding the injustice that persists in the world. Uh, Solomon's point here, I think, is clear. We're not meant to live forever in this life under the sun, so we should not imagine that we can achieve perfect justice and righteousness in our lifetimes either. Why would we think that? If we don't live forever, why would we think we'd be able to have perfect righteousness and perfect justice now? We suffer the same fate as the animals. He says, all go to one place. All, go, all are from dust, and to dust all return. So when he says all go to the same place, he's not talking about their finer spiritual destinations. He's talking about the dust. And that comes directly out of Scripture. So the original creation story may report the dominion that human beings have over animals, but it also reports or records 
that human beings were created from the dust. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And that we will return to the dust uh, at death. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. And he points out, well, it's pointed out several times in Scripture. Uh, that same verbiage can be found. You don't have to pull this up, sound booth. But in Job 10, 9 and, and 34, 15 and Psalm 104, 29 and 146, 4, you'll find that same reference that we're going back to, to dust. So it's a repeated theme in, in Scripture. So this still does not mean that human beings and animals experience the same fate after returning to the dust. The, the Solomon actually hints at this fact. Verse 21, he says, Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? This, that verse is notoriously difficult to translate. And I am not climbing, or claiming the spiritual high ground and the uh, knowledge of everybody that's better than everyone who's come before me on exactly what that means. Um, the exact same consonant could also be translated this way. Who knows the spirit of man who goes upward and the spirit of beast which goes down in the earth? One commentator insists that that cannot possibly be the meaning of the verse, and they go with the translation along the lines of the ESV, which is the original way I read it there, the ones up on the screen. And it has significance in that it changes an assertion the spirit of man goes upward while the spirit of the beast go down in the earth into an area of agnosticism. What do I mean when I use that word? So Gnostic comes from a word of what? Knowledge, gnosis. So agnosticism is you can't know. Okay, so that's what you're running into here. What, what you're run, what you, it appears that we're running into this agnosticism and that we can't know about this. Translate it again this way, who knows? Like, okay, nobody knows. So some go so far as to argue that from this agnosticism that Solomon is not uh, being consistently scriptural or orthodox. But the conclusion fundamentally misunderstands the larger context of, of Ecclesiastes. And that's why I said, remember, this is not the beginning and the ending of all teaching in the Bible. This is just one portion of the Bible, and we have to have the whole counsel of God. Ultimately, the doctrine of the immortality of the human soul isn't in question or imperiled by this passage at all. Uh, rather, it's correct when, it, well, the, even if the statement is agnosticism, saying we don't know, the point is not that the preacher is incapable of answering the question. Rather, that it's that Solomon is evaluating this question based on the ins insufficient information, stay with me here, that we can gather under the sun. Who knows? Or let me put it this way. Only God knows. And that's what he's saying. Not that it can't be known, but only God knows. So as man surveys life under the sun, he can't tell what happens to men or animals after they die. Does a man's spirit go up, his life uh, go up above? Does the spirit of animals go down below? No one seeing events under the sun can tell. The answer is a matter of revelation, not observation. You can't see what happens next. However, Solomon, he does identify the limitation of what he can observe, what he can see, in his second statement of what I saw. Namely, he sees that there's nothing better under the sun than to rejoice in our work, even in spite of the injustice and the unrighteousness of the world. That's verse 22, the beginning of it. So from our vantage point, it's impossible to see what will take place after we're gone. We can't see it. And we should not burden ourselves to seek out more than that. Now, verses 1 through 3, chapter 4, he notes all the oppressions that are done under the sun with horror, he looks at the tears of the oppressed, which you and I have got to see quite a bit on television lately. And what he, what he notices in the emphasis here, and it ties into what's going to come next, is the absence of anyone to comfort them. But do you have the verse? Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the other hand, he recognizes the, the power of their oppressor's hold. But again, same thing. There's no one to comfort the oppressed. So both here and in the next section, which is more familiar to you, you probably heard it in weddings, it's stressing the need for companionship. 
And the repetition of no one to comfort them has to do with isolation of those who suffer under, de under depression. He doesn't immediately condemn, if you notice here, the oppression is evil. He hasn't said that yet. And he doesn't need to. It's pretty obvious. So instead of addressing how evil oppression is, he, he grapples with whether life is worth living <clears throat> in light of the impression that we will encounter. He says, those who are already dead, <clears throat> I mean, this is so optimistic. Those who are already dead are more, more fortunate than those who are still alive. And, then, and that's not a blanket statement. For, uh, he's going to later say that the lowly who live are better off than the high and mighty who are now dead in Ecclesiastes 9. So remember that each verse here is not the beginning of the ending of a teaching. Uh, he has a very interesting way of approaching things. So that's not a blanket statement when he says it's better for those who are dead than those who are living. In this passage, he is saying that the dead are better off than the living who suffer helplessly under oppression. Then, second, he states that it's better off still for those who haven't even been born yet. So they don't have to see, quote, the evil deeds that are done under the sun, verse 3. So here we find Solomon's condemnation of those deeds of oppression as foul and evil. So the conclusion is it would be better not to have been born. It's actually common in the Bible. It's written in a bunch of different places. Job chapter 3, verses uh, 3 through 5. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 18. It's not an isolated statement in the Bible. And the connection to this point with other parts of the Bible, <clears throat> consistent with, with Solomon's perspective here, is one who speaks of observation of all that is under the sun, is, is he's giving us God's inspired word, but it's God's inspired word from the perspective of earth, not heaven. So even in our own day, even today, oppression marks a constant struggle of, of power and misery. One of the commentators I was reading wrote this quote, the problem of the oppressor and the oppressed in the history of mankind inevitably turned on the struggle of the strong over the weak, the strong who were able to impose the will over others without a God to answer to, humanists and secularists have little or no motivation to act righteously or abstain from wickedness especially if by that evil they can get their own way. As a result, the only outlook on life for such materialists is one of cynical resignation. It's better to be dead than to live through this. And isn't it interesting that that commentator ties oppression, or the oppressors, to lack of God. And if you think about the most oppressive governments in our world today, they all have one common, well, several commonalities, but one of them is they're all anti-religion. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so this constant power struggle, though, it never satisfies anybody. I mean, one of the questions that keeps getting asked in our current situation is, well, is he going to stop at Ukraine? And you ask that question because you've seen history. None of them have ever stopped at Ukraine or whatever. That, that, that thirst that's never satisfied. It only leads to despair and, and hatred of life it, itself. So, at verse 4 now. Solomon notes how much vanity is bound up in all the work we do. He says this, Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from, this is pretty interesting, uh, from man's envy of his neighbor. This is also vanity and a striving after wind. Verse 5, the fool holds his hands and eats his own flesh. What? Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. How many of you have read that before? All right. So this is the third evaluation. Notice how it starts, uh, verse 4, then I saw. So this is the third time we've seen then I saw. We're going to see it four times tonight. Uh, and he, he, in it, what he sees here is the vanity and the envy associated with our work. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work uh, come from a man's envy of his neighbor. Two ways to look at this. This can mean either one, that, the, that we work because of envying our neighbor, or two, the toil and skill of our neighbor leads us to envy what he has done. Most of the translations, including this one in the ESV, have adopted the, the first interpretation, but it could be possible that both are true. 
in like a cycle uh, uh, of envy producing work and work producing envy. Uh, and I think that's probably the best application of it. So in that vein, one of the commentators wrote this quote, all too much of our hard work and high endeavor is mixed with the craving to outshine or not to be outshone. Even in friendly rivalry, this may play a larger part than we think. For we can bear to be outclassed for some of the time and by some people, but not regularly and not too profoundly, end quote. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty right. That's it. Regardless, Solomon identifies a false solution to this dilemma of envy. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Okay. So rather than entering into the fray of envy of work and all that, the fool stays out of the envy, the arena altogether, folding his hands with ease. And while the fool's not consumed with envy, he ends up consuming himself through his laziness, destroying himself by his laziness. So how do we approach our work? If we're nothing to toil, uh, if we're not to toil to outstrip our neighbor, and we're not to settle back and do nothing, the solution is in verse 6. Better is a handful of quietness, a handful, how many hands is that? One. Then two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. So the idea is not to chase after two handfuls, which is toil and striving after the wind, but, to go, uh, but not to go without any handful at all. Rather, one should pursue what's needed, one handful, and they should do it in a manner that is marked by quietness rather than envy. Okay? Now we're going to read you the next section, 7 through 16. We're getting back to the vanity under the sun stuff. Again, I saw, that's the fourth time. Again, I saw under the sun one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better was a poor and wise youth than... So a little left turn here as he ties this up now. So when you hear this last part, he's speaking to the whole section we just read here. So, better was a poor and wise youth than an old foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne through his own kingdom he had been poor. I saw all the living who, may, who move about under the sun along with that uh, youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who came later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and striving after the wind. Okay, so this whole section is connected by a repetition of the words two and second in Hebrew. The same base word is used over and over in this section. It's actually a play on words, and it's connecting it. But our English Bibles, we translate that word or the root of that word, two or, or second, with a bunch of different words through this section, so you don't feel the connectivity that, that's really there in Hebrew. Uh, to the credit of the translators, e each word gives the specific sense of the word of two or, or second in its context, but it comes really um, at the detriment of you're missing what, how they, this whole thing is connected. It's much more broken when they don't use the same word all the time. So the first, the word second is also translated as other to describe a person who has no second person to serve as a companion. One person has no other. Do you see it there? Either son or brother. Well, the lack of companionship, that's tragic. Solomon actually has a more specific concern in mind here. Such a person without any second or other may live his life only for himself. 
So in doing so, he'll never satisfy his cravings, since he'll not only be seeking to meet his material needs, but also fill the absence of companionship in his life. So trying to fill such a gap with riches is an endless, futile pursuit, chasing after wind, vanity, so that there's no end to his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied because he doesn't have a companion, there's no other, there's no second. And then verse 7, we start seeing the necessity. Why cannot riches fill an absence in the relationships in our life? And the answer is in partially in verse 9, the second use of the word two. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. So again, this is a veiled allusion back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, when the Lord God said that it was not good for man to what? Be alone. So it's, that's the play here. And if it was not good in paradise, it's going to be a whole lot less good in the wilderness here. And then the word better appears frequently throughout the poetic and wisdom literature uh, to shape our evaluation of life. And better will come up several times in this chapter and next. So to reinforce the point of the need for a companion, the word two or second appears in three rapid proofs here. First, the word second appears in verse 410. As another, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. It's one of my fears in life. It's one of the reasons I don't go waiting alone anymore. I, I, I have this vision that I am waiting in water at low tide, about this deep, and I get stuck. And then the tide comes up. And I'm alone. Okay? I need a companion. Uh, Second time, verse 11 here, and right on, the, right on the seal. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one uh, keep warm alone? And then again, ver verse 12, and though a man might prevail against one uh, who is alone, two will withstand him, and three four cold is not, cord is not quickly broken. So two is better than one, but three is better still. You know, I learned that lesson in fishing. When I first started fishing, uh, and I'm talking marlin fishing, big giant fish here, um, we would take our mono line and tie it to a swivel, just one strand. And that worked, but it often broke. And then, you know what we, we decided to do? For the first 10 feet or so, we would make a double line. So we had a special knot that we would use called the Bimini twist that we would make a double line with, and that would be, you know, 10 feet or 3 feet or whatever the application was. But after we got working on that for a while, and it still broke, those two did, we found a better knot. It's a braid. Actually, it's called an Australian braid. And it takes the two strands and wraps them together with three. It's just like braiding hair, basically. Glory, when your hair is braided, how many strands are there? Three. See, that's what we do. So this is the perfect application. A three-fold cord is not quickly broken. Amen. Two's good. Three's better. And now we're going to get to the vanity of popularity. And that's what that last section is, is, is about. There are no limits to the benefits that we can gain from others' companionship, as Solomon showed us in, the, in this parable. This is a parable here at the end of this chapter. It begins something that sounds like it, it confirms what the preacher's been saying to this point, but it does it in a, like, a surprising way. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king which no longer knew how to take advice. He's continuing to urge the value of having a second here, Illustrated by the, you got the condemnation of the old and foolish king who no longer could take advice from any second or other, but it's backwards. And, and that, it, it, it's kind of surprising because in the Old Testament, the old are considered to be more wise than the young just by virtue of their collected wisdom of their years, where the young are considered typically to be foolish. That's the continuous presentation of the old and the young in the Bible, except here. So the reverse is true here. Verse 14, we see that the poor and wise youth comes to succeed the wise and foolish king. In a, in a, he gives us this rags to riches stories here, moving from prison and poverty all the way up to the throne, this guy, up to the point that the Solomon points out the necessity, of a, 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 the necessity of a second here is reinforced. And the twist, it comes in verse 15 and 16, and it sets off with the fourth use of I saw. I saw all the living who move about under the sun. Along with that, that's the second, youth who was, at, who, who was to stand in the king's place 
literally the translation there is stand in after the king or after him in his place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who came later will not rejoice in him. So the ESV translation gives a possibility of meaning, namely, that a great number, no end, of people uh, were led by this poor yet wise youth when he became young or became king. But I think, though, that the repetition of that word second that we've been seeing through this whole section, second or both or, or two, uh, talks really about a third ruler succeeding both the old and foolish king and the poor and wise youth. And the point there seems to be that all of this has to be replaced. The old and the foolish and the young and the wise alike, there's always something that comes after. And even the last one to succeed the first two, in spite of his great popularity, he eventually falls out of favor. And if that view is correct, then the second is really no ally to the one who came before him, but someone who replaces him. And then the second loses his public, public appeal, his popularity. And if that's not the interpretation, then the, it's still kind of clear. This paragraph has its obscurities, but it portrays something fami familiar in public life. The short-lived popularity of the great. How fickle people are, today's hero is tomorrow's bum. And then his final eva evaluation here. Like you haven't heard this before, but this is how he ends his sex section, and this is how we'll end tonight. Surely, this is also vanity and a striving after wind. Are you encouraged? Father, we thank you for uh, uh, the time to go through a scripture that I'm sure none of us have ever really paused to study before. And we thank you for the words of uh, the wisest man ever to live as we're told by the perfect Holy Spirit through his perfect word. Father, we understand that if there's any imperfection, it, it is in our understanding and not your writing. Help us to be uh, learners and, and understanders of your word and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.